how many people around the world do you think can speak more than one language? Do you consider yourselves to be bilingual or multilingual? Do you think that being bilingual is an oddity worldwide? If not, what do you think makes bilingualism a natural phenomenon? First, we will see that bilingualism is commonplace across the world. Second, that bilingualism is a form of language contact, which happens whenever two languages coexist in the same space for a given period of time, and surfaces in various forms. And third, that children are naturally equipped for language acquisition. And crucially, that our very brains can benefit from being bilingual or multilingual. If you want a simple definition of bilingualism, because you may have wondered what it is to be a bilingual, here's a simple one. A bilingual is an individual who can speak uh, two languages, who can function in two languages. A multilingual, therefore, is a person who can speak multiple languages. There are many definitions out there, depending upon a number of factors. So for instance, whilst in America, the standards to determine if somebody is a bilingual are pretty low, in such a way that anyone who can speak two languages fluently is deemed to be a bilingual, in Europe, the standards to determine whether somebody reaches the status of being bilingual are far higher. And in fact, it is only when you know, the individual has acquired the two languages simultaneously from birth, you're in childhood, that this person will be considered to be a bilingual. Leeway actually provides over 30 types, sorts of bilinguals ranging from native or early bilinguals, those who, you know, learned, acquired the two languages concurrently from childhood, to late bilinguals or adult bilinguals, those who acquired or learned uh, their second, third, fourth language after puberty during adulthood, okay? We usually call this in the field of linguistics foreign or second language acquisition. Now, an important fact that we cannot ignore in our quest to determine whether bilingualism is a natural phenomenon is the fact that bilingualism happens all over the world and is actually unavoidable. Um, bilingualism is the norm worldwide rather than the exception. One in every three people can be considered to be bilingual. An estimate that is actually on the conservative side because in fact, two out of three people, notice this is a staggering 66.6% .6 of the world's population, can be deemed to be bilingual if we take into account foreign language speakers or second language speakers. In a very broad sense, we all can be considered to be uh, bilingual. Let me illustrate this with an example. Think about it, when you speak your language, usually you are able to handle different registers, different varieties, even within the same language, okay? Let me illustrate this with English with concrete examples. Consider the following two English sentences, okay? On the one hand, you can't drink booze here, okay? Now contrast it, compare it to this other one. Consumption of alcoholic beverages is prohibited on these premises. These two sentences mean basically the same in English, right? Yet they employ completely, totally different words. The difference between these two sentences is a meaning difference and it resides in the fact that whereas the first one is characteristic of spoken, colloquial, informal English, the second one is proper, if you want, or uh, formal English and therefore is more likely to be found on written notices. But the two sentences basically mean the same, and however, they employ completely different terms, different words. So in a way, these examples go to show that even within the same language, we can handle different varieties. So to a certain extent, we all can be considered to be bilingual. Interestingly, the difference between language, dialect, variety, and so on and so forth, 
is not really a linguistic difference, but a sociopolitical one. And there is a famous quotation that you may have heard of in your lives, which summarizes this debate pretty accurately. A language is a dialect with an army and a navy. I will now discuss the second argument, which is the fact that you know, bilingualism uh, happens uh, across the world, as we know, but crucially, crucially, language contact is inevitable in bilingual situations. And language contact refers to the influence that what la one, one language exerts on the other or on the others due to coexisting in the same space, in the same territory for extended, prolonged period of periods of time. Of course, not just one weekend in London, okay? One typical example of this uh, language contact, this influence between languages, is the phenomenon of borrowings or loan words. Here, we are dealing with basically words that one language adopts from another language, okay? And which start being part of the system of that adopting language. English has borrowed numerous words from a number of languages, notably French, okay? And obviously Spanish, which is my mother tongue. Um, nowadays we find words such as cortado for a type of coffee, Siesta for a little nap after lunch, after eating, and also uh, tapas, for instance. Spanish has also borrowed numerous words, and English is no exception. Uh, a recent term that we employ in Spanish all the time is the famous or infamous word Brexit. <laughs> but without a doubt, the most noticeable, the most distinguishable feature of language contact is the phenomenon of code switching or code mixing. This phenomenon refers to the juxtaposition or the mixing of two or more languages within the same discourse, in the same communicative situation. A typical example of code switching concerns connecting or linking words. Okay, these are words that we use in the middle of, of, of sentences or phrases to connect parts of those sentences, okay? They include uh, terms such as well, yes, okay, fine, things like that, right? So, you know, if we have a sentence in English but we stick one of these linking words in Spanish, the outcome is a code switch sentence that involves, that features a connecting word. And an example would be something like, today, bueno, well, we are discussing bilingualism. But this is not the only domain of application of code switching. In fact, you can have intersentential code switching, so you can send, render sentence A in English and then sentence B in Spanish. But code switching can even apply within the same sentence and on occasion even within the same word. Code mixing is used amongst bilinguals spontaneously. No, both by native, early bilinguals, and by late bilinguals alike. And, you know, unfortunately, code switching has been looked down upon uh, in many societies, but contrary to popular belief, which actually sees code switching as a degeneration of language or a sign of lack of ability in the languages involved, code mixing, in fact, requires a high degree of proficiency, of level of mastery, if you want, in the languages implicated. So for instance, if I start this sentence in English and I manage to terminarla en español, finish it in Spanish, this is because I am at ease, I'm comfortable with the rules that govern English on the one hand and Spanish on the other, right? So you need to know the languages that you're using in order to be able to mix. Importantly as well, far from being a random mixture of the languages uh, involved, code switching actually tells us that not everything is valid. Let me illustrate this with an example. Remember, the point is that not every code switch is gonna be legitimate, it's not going to be grammatical for a bilingual. Take the Spanish verb comprar, okay, to buy. 
and let's turn it into a command, an imperative, we call it in linguistics, okay? Compra would be the form, okay? You buy something. Much like in English, Spanish allows the addition of a pronoun at the end of this verb, okay? As in buy it. Compra lo, compra la. We would use lo, la depending on the number, sorry, on the gender of the, of the object. But let's manipulate this sentence and turn the Spanish pronoun into its English counterpart or homologue, okay? It. The outcome of this operation would be something like compra it. I'm not sure how many of you are bilingual, English, Spanish bilinguals in the room, but I'm sure you will concur that this is a very strange sentence, probably grammat and grammatical. And it's even unintelligible. If you hear it out of the blue, compra it, people will be a bit shocked. Well, what this example shows is that not everything goes in code switching and that there are sophisticated, complex roles that underlie the use of this mechanism. There is more evidence undermining the idea that code switching is bad. And this evidence comes from other cultures. There are actually cultures across the world where code switching is considered to be a sign of prestige. In Papua New Guinea, for instance, switching between Buang, Tok Pisin, and Yaben is considered prestigious. And you will find it in you know, public speeches, political sermons, for instance, and so on and so forth. So whether code switching is good or bad is not really a linguistic decision. There is nothing inherently good or bad, positive or negative about code mixing. It is just an inevitability of being bilingual. But perhaps the strongest argument in favor of bilingualism as a natural phenomenon comes from the fact that children are naturally equipped to acquire language and that in fact our brains can benefit from being bilingual, from having more than one language in them. Children are naturally endowed for language acquisition. It's a miraculous phenomenon. They acquire language quickly, successfully, uniformly. They do it, you know, involuntarily, as I will show you in a second, and they do it crucially without any formal instruction on the part of their parents or caregivers. And this question of how come children are so talented for language, how they can acquire language so naturally, has been driving much research in linguistics for a long time now. One prestigious explanation for this talent, for this ability that children uh, possess actually concerns the brain, its plasticity. So it turns out that when we are born, our brain is extremely plastic or resilient. And uh, researchers have actually correlated this ability of the brain with language acquisition. Crucially, this plasticity, if you want, diminishes with time in such a way that after puberty, our brains are no longer as resilient. Well, this would go a long way to explain the differences between language acquisition when you are a child and late acquisition or learning when you are an adult. And we know that this second process is much more effortful and difficult than what, happened, what we observe with infants, with children. Children can learn language involuntarily, trust me. You will never see a two-year-old cover her ears and go, I am not learning French today. You will never observe that. You acquire language in a very spontaneous and natural way. What matters is the input, the language samples that you receive, that you are exposed to from the environment. So provided that the child has sufficient exposure to high quality, good quality input, language samples, the child will be bound to acquire that language. There is in principle no limit as to the number of languages that the child may acquire. And bilingualism is not really different. In fact, you can become a bilingual without formal instruction, without schooling. This is not to deny the importance of schooling. Schooling is crucial for the acquisition of many skills, such as literacy, etc. But you can become bilingual in a very naturalistic environment. 
You may recall the very beginning of the music video of the version of You Are Always On My Mind. There's no way I'm singing today, okay? This is Elvis's song uh, by, the, by the Pet Shop Boys. And at the beginning of the video, there's the old man who gets in the car and utters the following sentences. I'm a bilingual. I'm a bilingual illiterate. I can't read in two languages. Children typically manifest all the features that we attribute to bilingualism, to language contact. Recently, here in the city of Manchester, a trilingual teacher, okay, who, speaks, who speaks Italian, English, and Spanish, was confronted by the following question by a three-year-old. Hugo, dobbiamo comer now? Hugo, should we eat now? Mixing the three languages that the child spoke and that he, the child knew his teacher spoke. This is very important because actually it demonstrates how code switching is extremely natural and it happens from very early on amongst bilinguals, even when they are very, very young children. It is not just that children have this talent for language acquisition. It is also important to notice that bilingualism can bring a number of benefits, especially to the brain. Bilingualism, multilingualism has been reported to bring about a number of gains, a number of benefits. These include social, professional, and cognitive benefits. Social benefits include becoming multilingual, multicultural, or bilingual bicultural as a result of being able to communicate with the larger population across the world. Professional benefits include improving one's jobs prospects, okay, becoming more competitive in a more and more global international market. And cognitive benefits are numerous. I will just cite one here. A delay in the onset of Alzheimer's disease. Well, I told you a minute earlier that your brain is no longer as plastic after puberty during adulthood, right? But this does not preclude you from trying to acquire, to learn a new language. In fact, your brain can benefit from trying to learn a language during adulthood, okay? And interestingly, you know, it's never too late to cease to be monolingual. If you compare it to, for instance, vitamin D, you go out in the sun, you are exposed to some vitamin D, well, to the sun, and you get some vitamin D as a result. Well, it turns out that if you try to learn a second language when you are an adult, your brain can also get healthier if you want better as a result. Well, this again confirms the natural status of bilingualism, because after all, if being bilingual makes your brain better, that clearly points to its natural status. So all in all, bilingualism is a very natural and unstoppable phenomenon. As Li Wei put it in 2007, more and more people will become bilinguals across the world, and bilingualism will stay as long as humankind walks the earth. But don't forget, monolingualism can be cured. Thank you very much. Thank you.